and my name is Rick Murphy, and I'm a descendant of John Gowen and Margaret Cornish. Before we proceed, I need to make a disclaimer, even though this session is titled John Gowen's Descendants, Documenting America's Oldest African American Family, there's a full and robust discussion of the descendants of John Gowen and his first wife, Margaret Cornish, and the descendants from John Gowen and his second wife, whose name has now been lost to history. John and his first wife, Margaret, were born in Kabasa, Angola, and according to the colonial records, had only one child together. His name was Mihel Gowen. After Mihel's birth, Margaret subsequently had children with an English planter by the name of Robert Sweat. And hopefully in the future, Margaret Cornish's other descendants from the Sweat Cornish line will provide a similar presentation. I have another disclaimer. During the late 1970s and early 1980s, I had conducted substantial research on my Gowen line. During the same period in different parts of the country, in fact, the world, other researchers were also conducting similar research, yet independent also on the Gowen family. Based on the 1980s research with minor variations, each of the independent researchers ultimately arrived at the same conclusions. Myself and others used the only documentation found during the earliest periods of Virginia that were land records, deeds, indentures, and court cases. With the exception of the Bastardly Acts, there were no birth, death, or marriage records to explore the lineage in further detail. During this presentation, we're only going to explore the Gowen named family line, so let's begin. I am honored and privileged to be joined this morning with scholars and genealogists from around the country. Douglas Conwell from California, Dr. Shelley Murphy from Virginia, Stephen Wright from Kansas, and Dr. Wendell Goins from North Carolina. Each of our experts brings a different perspective to this conversation as each are descended from different genealogical lines of John Gowen. Before we get to our esteemed guests this morning, I would like to give you a little background information on John Gowen and Margaret Cornish and their arrival in what was then called English North America. John and Margaret's story begins on the African continent in the royal capital city of Cabasa, Angola. The Angolans, as well as the Portuguese, had a relatively peaceful commercial and business relationship for almost two centuries until the fall of 1618. Once the Portuguese found silver under the capital city, they sent 36 heavily armed ships to Angola to take control of the capital city. 2,000 of the royal citizens were captured, rounded up, enslaved, and sent to the port city of Luna, Angola, 100 miles away. Primarily, they were sent to South America and to the Caribbean islands. One of the last ships to arrive in Angola was one of the first ships to leave with the enslaved royal citizens. The ship, the San Juan Baptista, was under contract to take 350 now enslaved Angolans to present-day Mexico. After an unexpected stop in Jamaica and 500 miles off the coast of Mexico, the two English pirate ships attacked the Batista, believing it had gold and silver. After a grueling two-hour battle, the two successful English ships took 60 of the healthiest Angolans, split them between the two captains, and headed for the English colony of America, Virginia. According to a March 1620 census, there were 32 Angolans that lived in the colony of Virginia. Let's now meet our other panelists, and if each of you can introduce yourselves and explain to our audience how you're related to John Gowen. We'll start with Douglas Conwell. Doug? My name is Douglas Cornwall. I'm related to John Gowen through his grandson, William Gowen, and his great-grandson, Edward Gowen Sr., who was born in 1681. Good morning. My name is Shelley Murphy. I relate to John Gowen through his grandson, Thomas Christopher, born in 1660, and through Thomas's son, James, born in 1675. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Lee Wright. I descend from John Gowen through his son, Mahill, and Mahill's grandson, William, who was born in 1680. Hi, my name is Dr. Wendell Goins, and I descend from Agnes Goins, who descends from John Gowen. Thank you, guys. Each will be back in a minute or two. As previously mentioned, the independent research done in the 1980s all came up with similar research findings based on land records, the only legal documents found during this period of English America. It should also be noted that some of these records were reconstructed within the individual counties after the centralized records were burned in Jamestown during Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. Although we cannot provide an exhaustive list of documentation in this very short presentation, 
you will notice that we, in each document discussed, will be footnoted in the bottom right-hand corner of each document. We have followed genealogical proof standards, also known as preponderance of proof or evidentiary proof for each generation and family member discussed. To help with our panel members' presentations and our viewing audience, we have also provided family trees to help you follow the discussions. You will notice that John Gowen, Michael Gowen, or Michael Gowen, based on previous research, had four sons. Daughters are unknown. William, Daniel, Christopher, and Thomas. William, we know, is the uh, son of Michael based on documentation that was provided in various land grants. The mother was Prosa. The other three sons, Daniel Gowen, Christopher Gowen, and Thomas Gowen, the mother is unknown, lost to history. This particular presentation, Douglas and I descend from William Gowen, and Shelley and Steve descend from Thomas Gowen. It is believed that John Gowen had another son named Philip. Based on that belief and the research of others, Philip had four known children, George, Agnes, David, and Marianne Gowen. Now we believe that there may be a generation missing between each of these based on the ages, and one of our panel members will discuss that momentarily. Wendell descends from Agnes Gowen. We're most fortunate to have Wendell because he also has the Gowen or Gowen's name. Now, one of the other things we want to talk about is variant names. In the variant names, the Gowen name is spelled differently. So you will notice in our presentations, based on the various land documents or other documentation uh, provided, that the name Gowen is spelled differently. There are thousands and thousands of Gowens all across the country, and probably as many, if not more, uh, individuals who, who believe they have Gowen ancestry in them. We're most fortunate today that we have one of our panel members, Dr. Wendell Gowens, uh, is a Gowen family member with the last name Gowens, which means that the name was passed down from father to son to son, generation to generation. Wendell, before you start, I, I have a, another question I want to ask you before you start your presentation. Even though we have all these Gowen family members all over the country, many of us find it very difficult to trace our ancestry back to the 1800s, the 1700s, let alone the 1600s, let alone the John Gowen. Can you tell us uh, how you were able to find your documentation, which has been somewhat recent in the last uh, five or 10 years, how you found out that you were a Gowen um, and what tools did you use to help find out? Thank you for being here. I joined one of the Facebook groups uh, that uh, is concentrated on the Goins family. And uh, through this Facebook group, one of the members who is a Goins descendant uh, placed some documents on the Facebook group. And they've been doing this off and on for the past year. Uh, and uh, of course we look at them, but my mother happened to see this one before I did, where there was a application to the Cherokee uh, Indian tribe uh, for the uh, Gowen Miller roles uh, that was uh, from 1908. And uh, we happened to see that on the cover was my ancestor, Henry Taylor Goins. And uh, we were just, just, just remarkably surprised about this. And it had uh, not only listed his name, it listed his, his father's name and his grandfather's names and his great uncle names. And uh, this was amazing. This is what took us back uh, to our uh, Lewis Goins, uh, who was uh, born in the, in the 1700s uh, and uh, who was the grandfather of the one who filled out the application. Uh, so this is amazing uh, to our family. And, and uh, from there, we were able to find uh, the same person uh, several months later, uh, put up a, a will of uh, Lewis Goins' father, naming Lewis Goins as his youngest son. Uh, so through Facebook, we were able to go back two generations uh, from what we've been able to determine uh, via census records. Uh, totally an amazing story. This first picture is the cover page of the application filled up by my great, great grandfather, Henry Taylor Goins, for Cherokee tribal membership in 1908. 
The background on this is that in 1902, the Eastern Cherokees sued the United States government to get funds due to them under treaties um, that were uh, it meant treaties that uh, they had uh, agreed upon back in the 1800s to certify eligibility in the Cherokee tribe. Guin Miller, uh, who was appointed an agent for the Interior Department uh, to be a commissioner for the Court of Claims, he compiled a Guin Miller roll of applicants. There were approximately 45,000 enrollment applications filed representing about 90,000 individuals. A total of 30,000 individuals were found to be eligible. And these applications are online. Anybody can look at them. A wealth of information. The page one names my great great grandfather Henry Taylor Goins. It names his father Anderson Goins. And it names his children, including my great grandfather Walter Goins. Page number two names my great great grandfather's siblings. It names my great-great-great-grandfather's name, listed as Lewis Goins. This was a bombshell for us. It also lists Lewis Goins' other children. And on the last page is the signature page. And what's significant about this is that my great-great-grandfather could not write. He's got an X there. And it all, this helps explain also why his wife's name is misspelled Winslow instead of her maiden name being Wheeler. As you can see, I have confirmed the relationship of my direct ancestors over four generations from my great-grandfather, Walter, born in, 17, in, excuse me, in 1873, to Henry, born in 1848, to Anderson, born in 1815, to my great, 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 great grandfather, Lewis Goins, born in 1790 in Rockingham County, North Carolina. Wendell, thank you very much for that. That was most informative. Um, the producer told me uh, in my ear that I asked how you knew you were Goins, and obviously you, you know that through your last name. What I meant to ask you, how did you know you were Goins through your family documentation? And the way you walked us through that was perfect. Um, the other thing is I want to say for our audience this morning who's watching this, um, at the bottom of the screen what we decided to do was to put the website where you can find the actual information about the Eastern Cherokee court claims. Um, and that was very helpful, Wendell, how you walked us through that in terms of explaining what it is um, and how folks can get additional information. Our, our next panelist this morning is Douglas Cornwall. Um, and Doug, can you walk through the Goins family on our line um, for the period of the 1800s. Second great grandmother, Harriet Goin, was born in Granville County, North Carolina in 1852. The Goin family had ties to other very prominent families in this area, most notably Howells and the Chavis family. They were intermarried and uh, neighbors for uh, many generations and in fact, Harry Goen married a man, Christopher Howell. They got married in Granville County in 1875. Harriet's parents, Henry Goen and Polly Martin, married in Rockingham County, North Carolina. Rockingham County is a neighboring county to Granville, but it was one of the counties that was created when the larger Granville County was subdivided in subsequent years. Henry Goen and Polly Martin married in 1838, as you can see by the second document here we're showing on the screen. Henry Goen's parents, Edward Goen V and Rebecca Anderson, were both from long established African American families in Granville County. These families such as Harris, Bass, the Anderson and the Goen families were prominent families who held large tracts of land. The records of their transactions leaves, leaves a wealth of genealogical information in the county records from which we find uh, the marriage certificate between Edward Goyne V and Rebecca Anderson. They got married in 
Granville County, North Carolina in 1807. We're showing the certificate here on the screen and notable, you can see the father's names, Edward Goen IV. This marriage certificate from 1807 is fantastic. It brings us all the way back into the 1700s with the names of the fathers. Thank you, Doug. Our next panel member is Shelley Murphy. And Shelley, can you share with us who your Goins family is during the 1800s? Mary Catherine Goins Marsh, my second great grandmother. I have her death certificate. She died in 1905 in Manistee County, Michigan. I also found the 1860 census. Uh, Mary Catherine in the household of her father, Lawson Goins and they're in Jefferson County, Virginia. In addition, I found in the Jefferson County in the past newspaper, Lawson's Goins obituary, which was reprinted in 1944, and he died in 1874. In addition, we have his death certificate, which was located for Clark County, Virginia, him dying 12, July 1874, also shown his parents, Joseph and Nancy Cohen. Thank you, Shelley. And our last panel member for this round of the 1800s, uh, Steve, can you share with us the history of your family um, on the Goins side? In my Goins line, Margaret Grindstaff, who is John Goins' seventh great granddaughter and my second great grandmother, Margaret's husband was my second great grandfather, Jacob Allen Fletchall. Here in this slide, we are looking at the marriage record of two of their sons, Edward Fletchall and Lorenzo Fletchall. Lorenzo is my great grandfather, and we'll say more on him later. What we see here entered into this Iowa marriage record for Page County, Iowa, 1880 to 1945, all of their names. And if we do a close-up of the same document, as we show here in this slide, we see the names of my second great-grandparents. We see Jacob Fletchall's name, with his wife Margaret being indicated only by her, ma her maiden name of Grindstaff. Now, I don't have a picture of Margaret, but this picture we are looking at was taken, I believe, on the occasion of Margaret's funeral. This newspaper photograph shows Jacob with seven of his children Jacob is seated in the front row between his two daughters. The son standing up behind his father, which we have circled here, is my great-grandfather, Lorenzo Seymour Fletchall. Next to him on your left is his brother, Edward. These are the two Fletchall brothers who married Wright sisters as shown on that Page County, Iowa marriage record. Now we are moving on back through this line and we show here evidence of Margaret's family in this census record for the year 1890, Worth County, Missouri. Circled are the names of Jacob Grindstaff and highlighting the name of Rebecca, her maiden name was Byerly. These are the parents of Margaret. Here in this slide, we see the 1850 Knox County, Kentucky census report and this is where we make our connection to Goins in my line. Rebecca Byerly was the daughter of Harmon Byerly and Edith Goins Byerly. Looking here at line 37, we have listed the household of Harmon Byerly at this time. The names listed below the number 161 on the left. Here is Harmon's name and Edith's, along with Edith's younger brother, William, older brother, Meshach, with a Chavis and a Fisher also listed. So what we are looking at here is the record of the marriage of Harmon Byerly and Edie or Edith Goins as it appears in the U.S. and international marriage records, 1560 to 1900. Edith Goins' parents were Daniel Goins and Susanna Inman. This document, which is a tax record for the year 1800, shows Daniel Goins' family, and part of the list is not showing here, but the list is in alphabetical order and Daniel's Inman in-laws names appear below. In the 1800s, my Goins line daughters out with Edith Goins who married Harmon Byerly. 
Edith's father was Daniel Goins and her mother was Susanna Inman. Susanna outlived her husband Daniel by six years. Daniel died in 1810 and Susanna died in 1816. What we are looking at here is an inventory of Daniel's estate after his decease. We see this is the same Daniel from Jefferson County, Tennessee. And we see Daniel's wife, Susanna Inman, acting as the administrator of her husband Daniel's estate. Also, we want to notice here that they were now living in Tennessee. My Goins family was among the founders of the state of Tennessee, and they became Tennesseans, having formerly been North Carolinians without even, even having to move. They did not move, but with the forming of the states rather than the territories, the boundaries moved. This all has to do with a land grant obtained by Daniel's father, William, and the fact that he was one of the signers of the historic Cumberland Compact, and we will speak more to this later. This summarizes my Goins family in the 1800s. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that there are Goins family members all across the country. We represent a very multiracial family, Americans of African, Native American, and European descent. We also have something in common, not just the Goin name, is the love for genealogy. And I think it is within that love that many of us constantly try to find our ancestors, how we're related to them, and how we're related to one another. My research started in the 1980s, and as I indicated, there were others domestically and internationally who were also doing research on the Goin family. I came across one gentleman in the early 1990s. His name was Arlie Goen from Texas. Arlie and I communicated a number of times over the telephone, and I'm just sorry I never got to meet with him personally. Arlie died in 2014, and he left his papers to the, to the Texas Technical University. In fact, Arlie had conducted so much research that there is exactly 25 boxes of materials on his family, including the Goins line. Another gentleman by the name of Paul Heineck, who was living overseas and was sending for different papers um, so he can conduct research on free African Americans of Virginia, North Carolina. While I was very familiar with Paul's work, I didn't get to meet him until a couple of years ago. Um, and both of these gentlemen, um, as I indicated, my research aligned with theirs in many different ways. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, we have provided information where you can provide, where you can find additional documentation on the Goins family. So it's really important that those of you who are interested in uh, the Goins family begin to conduct your research. Now, what's interesting is I believe that my in-depth desire to learn about the Goins family was certainly piqued by a 1977 miniseries called Roots. And in talking to Arlie many, many years ago, he indicated that when Roots came on uh, TV in the miniseries on ABC television, he knew so much about his family, he was determined to do the same thing. Paul Hynek's story is a little bit different. Through his wife's family, he knew an awful lot about African Americans of the South, and he was determined to pull together as much information as he could on his uh, wife's family throughout North Carolina and Virginia. Those of us who have the Goins name, we all say we're related. Some of us are, and some of us may not be. But what we decided to do was to look at our DNA matches to see whether or not Douglas, Shelley, Steve, Wendell, and myself, in fact, match through DNA. So what I'm gonna do is ask Douglas to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what he found through a quick DNA search. And I'm gonna have Wendell later on, who is a medical doctor, have a more in-depth conversation about DNA. So with that, Douglas, can you just give us a brief discussion about DNA? DNA can be really helpful in trying to trace your family lineage. In this case, all of the researchers compared our DNA results 
to see if we matched. And in fact, in this case, because our common ancestor are so far back, uh, more than seven or eight generations, it's, it was impossible to get really accurate results. But if we opened up the search and criteria, um, we would expect to see a match on a low level between all of us. And in fact, that's what we saw. Even though all of us did our DNA results on different platforms, whether it be Ancestry or 23andMe or some other, we could compare them using the GEDmatch tool. In the GEDmatch tool, we did see matching on particular chromosomes um, for everybody, thus confirming how we all are related through the Goins line. Although we're truncating our research for this presentation, we don't want anyone to think that the research on our Goin lines have been easy. The 1700s was really challenging for each of us to connect the dots to our ancestors and that of John Goin, his son Mihel, and Mihel's sons William. So this has really been a challenging process for, for all of us. So Douglas, this round, I'd like to start with you. And can you share a little bit about the uh, land records that helped our family research the Goins line in the 1700s? Trying to trace your family back through the time always presents some challenges. In our case, we use the land records to trace the family back starting in Granville County, North Carolina. Family had owned various plots of land and recorded through time, moving from Granville County back into Virginia. Uh, we continued to use the land records to find a family all the way through uh, the 1700s and into the 1600s in Virginia. The various counties in Virginia also held land records uh, where the family had property um, down into the Tidewater area. So following the land records, we come to Edward IV, who, my ancestor who lived in Granville County in 1810. You can see here in the land records. Edward IV had lived here on this land for some time and his land was adjacent to his brothers and his father, his father's land was in Butte County, North Carolina. Edward IV, we can see on a subsequent document, was mustered into the North Carolina 5th Regiment in the Revolutionary War. Edward's father, Edward III, lived in the adjoining land, which happened to be Butte County, North Carolina. It's very interesting we know this because we find the Butte County, North Carolina tax list uh, for 1771 with Edward Goen there. Edward Goen was also a Revolutionary War soldier who fought in the North Carolina Regiment uh, from Butte County. One of the really valuable things from the record of Edward III's military service is that he was born in Virginia. This led us directly to his father, Edward Goen Jr., or Edward II, who was in Charles City, Virginia. And we see that from a land record found in 1748. From Edward Jr. in 1748 in Charles City, Virginia, we go on to find his father, Edward Sr., owning 100 acres of land in Kingston, Gloucester County, Virginia in 1705. Thank you, Doug. Um, Question, however, um, I noticed that you've got a lot of Edwards in your family tree. Any challenges there? In tracing the family back through the land records, it was really challenging because the family had a habit of naming their sons all the same name. We had an Edward Sr. all the way to Edward V. So it made it really challenging to decipher which generation we were talking about and which generation was in the land records. Um, one of the things that genealogists have to decipher on their way to uh, finding out the truth. Thank you, Doug. Steve, now you had some challenges in researching your family line, but you also were able to uh, track your line through some of the land records as well. So can you share with us 
some of your challenges and um, what you were able to find through the land records. Now we begin to show the family of Daniel Goins. Daniel's parents were William Shadrach Goins and Anastasia Sullivan Goins. Notice I just gave you Shadrach as William's middle name. The family utilized the name Shadrach quite often, along with Meshach and Abednego, of course. This may be the origin of my father's family's tradition when it's time to go to bed to say, Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. There are some other names here that we see that get repeated often in the family as well, like John and William and Christopher, and also Daniel. For instance, this Daniel mentioned here as the father of David Goins, the one who got killed by Indians, was a cousin to my Daniel of the same family and generation. We are looking at this piece of the record for several significant reasons. First, we have a record here of a raid by Indians on a place called Vansker Station, a present day restored state historic site, which is in what is now called uh, Goodlettsville, Tennessee, and you can look that up. We see that it was David Goins, grandson of William, who was shot through a porthole in the wall as he lay in bed asleep. And then William was the executor for his grandson's estate as verified on March 4, 1783. As we continue to examine this document, we see that Grandfather William was one of the signers of the Cumberland Compact. The Cumberland Compact is a historical document of great importance showing the names of the founding families for what would become the state of Tennessee. As we will see, William was a Revolutionary War soldier and as a war pensioner, he obtained a tract of land upon which he and his extended family settled. And having found the documentation for this in my family, I now also know how my Goins family came to be in Tennessee. Having started in Virginia and moving into North Carolina, now they are in Tennessee. The land that William obtained was originally part of North Carolina, but with the forming of this new state of Tennessee, the borders moved. So having formerly been North Carolinians, this family of Goins now become residents as founding members of the state of Tennessee. From there, some would move into Kentucky, which is where my Goins line daughters out and continues to push west, first into Missouri, and then into Kansas, and then Colorado, and all the way to Oregon. That's my family, coast to coast. On this very important piece of paper, which no doubt was handled by everyone in William's family, certainly by William himself, and probably by everyone in the settlement. Here we are looking at the actual land grant pertaining to this North Carolina becomes Tennessee event. Reflecting on William's military service, which is integral to all of what we have been looking at here, we now see a copy of William's military record. He was part of Virginia's 14th Regiment. And speaking of military service, this was a family tradition. John Frederick Goen and Mary Keefe were the parents of William Shadrach Goen. The Goens were active participants in all of the wars, the conflicts between the British and the French, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and every war since. The Goens and their descendants have always been proactive in the defense of this nation. John Frederick's father was known as William Cherokee Goins because his mother was Cherokee. Now, John Frederick's grandmother, Winona or Winuna Dakota, also Anne, given as her middle name, uh, her story is pretty much lost to the unrecorded past for us, but we think that this enrollment document for the Eastern Band of the Cherokee indicates her with the initials W.A., that's number 563, the second line from the top. And you will also notice many other Goins listed in this document. John Frederick's grandfather, Thomas, was the son of Mahill Goins, grandson of the patriarch John. But whereas Douglas and Rick descend from Mahill's son, William, and William's mother is documented as being Angolan, 
Mahill apparently married a European woman after this, and Shelley and I descend through that line. One of the reasons that we are able to authenticate the colonial Virginia Goans is because they were in the courts a lot. I could have picked any number of documents, but I include this one from the Westmoreland County, Virginia order book, 1690 to 1698, where the record of the suit for defamation was filed and withdrawn by Abraham Smith against my ninth great grandfather, Thomas Gowen. And this is also simply for the purpose of showing the family's presence in the Virginia colony. And here is a land patent record showing this Goins family, their presence and their holdings in Virginia. Steve, as you plowed your way through the 1700s in terms of your research, uh, please share with the audience some of the challenges that you encountered. So this has proven to be quite an adventure for me and has represented a number of challenges. Doing this type of research, especially when you are looking at African American history, is very difficult, especially if those ancestors connect to the time of slavery. This particular family line is interesting because of when it starts and how it starts. And there is a lot more documentation than you would ordinarily find, which makes it somewhat nicer for us, but it is not without its problems. A lot of times people, well, whether they were actually married or not, we don't even really know. There may or may not be documentation of that, or there may not have been a document filed or that can be found. So there's a lot of challenges like this, but wonderful discoveries. The For me, the finding out about this story from the beginning when I just started doing my research on my father's family and I saw this name Goins. I had no idea where that would take me. And it took me to the 20 Angolans who were brought to Virginia in 1619. And now looking at this for this presentation, one of the standouts has been learning about the Cumberland Compact. And I'm gonna have to learn more about that because it's piqued my interest to find out more about how my people were involved in how the state of Tennessee was formed. There's just many wonderful things that come out of this kind of a project and I, it's been a privilege to be a part of this. Thank you, Steve. Shelley, can you share with us some of the challenges you had during the 1700s and the different types of documents you used to trace your going ancestry and connect the dots? Throughout this research process, there was numerous challenges. Number one, we're in a different record set. We're now looking in the 18th century, which again, is not our typical genealogical records that we're gonna see. We're gonna have to rely on the land records and following a lot of money type transactions. Also another challenge was looking at the naming pattern. It seems as though every generation would have two or three of the same names of the previous generation. The fathers named a son after themselves, and then there's a brother that would have named one of their sons after their brother or their father. And that was a continuous challenge. And also knowing if the county was burned or not and where some records could be. So there was numerous challenges throughout this whole research of almost 30 some years of locking down from generation to generation. So the focus had to be again on the land baton records, what was going on, and also to know the law at the time my ancestors were alive. Thank you, Shelley. As you can see, each of us had challenges with our family lines. And Wendell, you had a very unique challenge in connecting the dots on your family. So if you can walk us through the 1700s and tell us some of the challenges you had. Once we found the document connecting Lewis Goins to Joseph Goins, immediately a, a light bulb struck in our head because we had seen documents before where, Lewis, where Joseph Goins 
was named as a child of Agnes Goins. And that document uh, is a court case uh, back in Louisa County in Virginia, where he was bound out to a James Bunch at age 12 uh, to stay to age 21, uh, when uh, he and his sister were both removed from Agnes, Agnes Goins' care. Uh, so this was amazing for us. Uh, and this was our link that we have been looking for. Wendell, for this project, you had the good fortune of having the last name Goins. Um, so you had that advantage over Shelley, Doug, and myself. But oftentimes with good fortune comes big hurdles. Um, now, fortunately for Douglas, Shelley, and, and, and Steve, we were able to trace our lineage through our male Goins lines, even though we had daughters in the family. They were closer in generation, so we had documentation for them. But you have the extra burden of having a female further back in your line, which uh, prevented, uh, presented itself some challenges. So share with the audience a little bit about the challenges you had in the 1700s. One of the biggest challenges I had, I think is a challenge that all Goins researchers are gonna have, is trying to connect their family trees back beyond 1700s to the 1600s. Uh, we had gone back as far as Agnes Goins, who was born in 1720 uh, era, but we were, had a hard time trying to figure out where did she come from. Look at Paul Hynek's work. He's said that she's a child of Philip, but it, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Philip's born in 1650. She's born in 1724. Um, however, she's listed uh, there in the same area as Philip Goins. Uh, and uh, along with several other children born in the early 1700s, uh, listed as her siblings. And so we can probably assume that she's a member of Philip's family. Um, however, she may be more of a granddaughter. Um, but these are challenges I think that all Goins researchers are gonna have uh, because of the records uh, from that era are lacking. Yeah, the challenges that confront most of us Goins researchers is that uh, during this period of colonial Virginia uh, and the period right soon after uh, during the Jim Crow, during the slavery era, was that uh, women um, who had a last name Goins uh, had children and their children took their name. Uh, and they, I think they did this to a, so that, that the uh, powers that be would identify them as uh, free people. Uh, the Goinses were known as free people. Uh, so Agnes Goins, the only reason why we know about Agnes Goins uh, and not who her mother is, is because Agnes Goins had a reputation. She was noted in several court cases for having many children out of wedlock, her children being taken and bonded to other people uh, to raise them. And, and so therefore she's, she's very, very much renowned. And this is why I think we've been able to identify her. Thank you, Wendell. Wendell, I have to admit, there are those who are deep into genealogy, but they're deeper into the discussion around DNA and, and chromosomes and Y DNA and autosomal DNA. And I have to admit that a lot of this stuff, just I just glass over it because uh, I, I can't get into it as much as some of our other friends out there. But as a medical doctor, can you kindly share with the audience um, some information about DNA and the Goen family, um, and in particular, how all of us could be related in one way or another, which kind of builds upon the discussion that Douglas had earlier in, to, in terms of the five of us being related and how others can connect to us as well. So if you can kind of share that with us in a fashion that makes it a little easier for those of us who are not into biology and DNA. My male ancestors, have carried the Goen surname since the 1700s. I found out in 2009 that my Y DNA was associated with a Tom Collins and his descendants. There were several other people that I had met through Ancestry and later through Family Tree DNA who had their Y DNA tested back in 2009, who also shared the same Y DNA and the same Goen surname. And we looked at markers on the Y DNA, and we could estimate when we had a uh, when we last shared a common ancestor, and that was determined to be somewhere in the 1700s. After talking it over with more DNA experts at Family Tree DNA, 
especially those working with the Goins Project there, it was concluded that Tom Collins fathered children with a female Goins and that the most likely candidate would be an Agnes Goins, born somewhere between 1720 to 1724. When looking at the locations, the migration patterns, property exchanges, court documents, and marriages from that era in Louisa County, Virginia, you see that there are several family names closely associated with the Goins family, and they included the Collinses, the Gibsons, the Bunches, among many others. Uh, these groups of people were of mixed heritage, they traveled together, and they migrated together. You can follow their migration patterns from the Pamunkey River area in the 1670s uh, to the Flat River area, which is on the border of Virginia and North Carolina in, by the 1720s. And then by the 1770s, um, they were all migrating to, through Greenville County, which is now Orange or Person County, on their way through Rockingham County. Uh, where Gornstown is located. And then some of these continue to migrate. They continue to move and travel west across the Cumberland Gap um, prior to the uh, 1800s, uh, moving into Tennessee, where you have the Goins, the Melungeon group there. Uh, some moved to Ohio and then to Kentucky. Wendell, thank you for sharing that with the audience this morning. Um, as you know, you and I, along with Doug, Shelley, and Steve, um, had an objective today, and we wanted to demonstrate how Americans of, uh, of an African ancestor, particularly one who came to these shores in 1619, can trace their family lineage all the way back to our patriot ancestor, John Gowen. We had challenges, and that was the purpose and the intent of this session this morning was to share with you our particular challenges and the difficulties we had in connecting back to John Gowen. When we did this, we clearly understood that we each would approach this very differently. Underlying purpose was to dispel any myths that Americans of African descent can't trace their lineage back. Now, we're somewhat fortunate that John Gowen and his descendants were in fact, based on most of the colonial records that any of us could find, were free people of color. In the early colony, Virginia never thought to collect data on its residents based on birth dates, marriage dates, and death dates. And as a result of that, the only records that are found, particularly in the 1600s, are those land documents. To make it even more challenging, during Bacon's Rebellion, when Jamestown was burned, the records were burned with Jamestown. Some of the records were reconstructed, but if you uh, have a family member who, during a certain period of time, those records were not reconstructed, unfortunately, your ancestor, along with their documentation, has been lost to history. That's why it was important to each of us to share with you our family trees so that those of you who are having um, unique challenges will be able to see our trees and hopefully based on the resources that we provide at the end of this session, you'll be able to branch out and look for siblings and therefore begin to build your trees on that. If you'll notice, each of us started off with our second great grandparents. So Douglas started with Harriet Gowen in 1852, went through the different generations and wound up with William Gowen in 1655. Shelley started with her second great grandmother, Mary Catherine Gowen, and worked her way up to James Gowen, who was a son of Thomas. It's believed that Thomas had another son who was William, and that's the line that Steve starts with his great second great grandmother, mother, Margaret Vinshaff, all the way up to William Gowen. And based on the research of others, we believe that John Gowen had another son who was Philip, and Walter Gowens is the second great grandfather of Wendell Gowens, all the way up to Philip through Agnes Gowen. So we're hoping that this is helpful to you. We hope that you'll look for the siblings. We hope that you will do similar family trees. And more important, we hope that you share those trees so that we can begin to branch out on this.
If you stayed with us during this entire presentation, you really have to be a diehard genealogist. Um, we get technical, we get down in the weeds, we provided documentation, um, and this is not necessarily your most exciting discussion or panel. Um, and if you stayed with us, um, either you're a, a, a diehard genealogist or you're a going family member and you were hoping that in some small way, uh, we could help pave the way for you to find your going ancestry. I'd like to thank our panel members today, Douglas Conwell from California, Dr. Shelley Murphy from Virginia, Stephen Wright from Kansas, and Dr. Wendell Goins from North Carolina. This was a very interesting session for us. Um, we've been working on this for the past five or six months. It really stretched us in terms of our knowledge, um, our research capabilities, and we hope that you got something out of it. And at the end, we will have some uh, research information that might help you going forward. So until we meet again, thanks. And those of you who are going family members, thanks for hanging in there with us, cousins. <laughs>